Thank you for reading that. Well done. Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Doing well today? Good. I want you to know that you've been prayed for. And you are not here by accident. The Lord has brought you here. And we've been praying that God would be moving among us. And my hope is that indeed you have or will hear from Christ. Go beyond what I'm saying into what Christ would say to you this morning. And so that passage, there's a lot going on there. And I'm going to highlight what we see about Jesus in this passage. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you would recognize that the reason why this gospel was written is so that we would understand the identity of Christ, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, giving yourself to Him, trusting your life to Him. That you and I and all who believe may have life eternal in his name. So the entire gospel is written with that focus in mind. And so when we read it and there's interesting and intriguing questions that we can and should ask of the text. But primarily we should be asking the question, what does this passage teach me about Jesus and how does it point me towards knowing that he is the Son of God, the Christ? Now, my hope is that if you're not a Christian here today, we're so glad that you're here. Perhaps you're investigating who Jesus is, that you would take a step closer in your understanding. And if you're here today and you say, I believe I have commit myself to Christ, my hope is that your love for him would grow deeper, your honor of him would grow higher, and that you would worship him. The point of this passage, by the way, is not just a physical healing, even though that was astounding, and it showed this is something only God could do. The point is not the opening the eyes of someone who is physically blind, but opening the eyes of someone who was spiritually blind so that they could see him. And so there's a number of things, again, about Jesus that I'm going to focus in on on this passage. I'm not going to reread it because there's a lot there. We just heard it. But we're going to look at a few things. And I want you to, again, gain information, knowledge, and hopefully glorify Christ even stronger. So the first thing in this passage we notice is, number one, Jesus is the initiator. Now, I don't want you to think that Jesus is some passive and weak individual just, you know, going along and hoping people don't hurt him, okay? If that's your image, put that to the side. He is a strong man. He is a um, disciplined man. He is a man who stands for truth as he is walking in God's purpose and plan. He has grace, of course, but he is not weak-willed, nor is he being bullied by those around him. He initiates, he connects, he pursues. And so there was this conflict in the last chapter, chapter 8 of John, and we saw how that all unfolded for weeks and how there was um, questions about who he was and questions about who were indeed children of God. And Jesus said some strong and remarkable things about himself, and he's saying these things over and over and over again. The last thing he said in chapter 8 was he said that before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews here hearing him, and it could have been hundreds if not thousands of people, they recognized that he was claiming divinity. And at that, those who did not believe picked up stones and they were going to kill him right then. But it wasn't his time. He didn't come to be killed that way, but he came to give his life. And so, by God's providence and sovereignty, he slipped away. And verse in chapter 9 picks up the story. So as they were going along, Jesus noticed a man born blind. 
Now, this man, of course, couldn't notice Jesus because he could not physically see. But Jesus sees those who other people fail to see. And we can say amen, right? He sees you. Even though you may not see him, he knows you. He sees you. He hears you. Jesus does do that, and he continues to do that even today. Jesus saw him, so the disciples saw him. Jesus initiated with him. Jesus sent him in this passage. Jesus then came back to him. Over and over and over and over again in the Gospels, we read Christ calling out and initiating and speaking and claiming and protecting and going to. He indeed is the great shepherd, and we'll read about that next week. But Jesus initiates, connects, goes to people. Let us have that heart and let us acknowledge that about him. He connects, he initiates. This is our Christ. Now the next thing we see about Jesus is that Jesus is the authority. As you read the Gospels, you will understand that people asked him questions all of the time. And Jesus' response wasn't, well, I don't know the answer, right? He didn't say, hmm, let me go check with my concordance and figure that out, right? He didn't say, oh, that's over my pay grade, not once ever, right? He never was fishing around for answers, right? It was said about him that no one speaks like this man. No one teaches like this man. When he speaks, he speaks as one who has authority, one who knows what he's talking about. And they were captivated by his teaching. In this instance, this was no different. Now, at that time, there was a common thought in their theology that specific sins equaled specific consequences, okay? And so when they saw this man who was now older, who had been born blind, their assumption was, well, obviously this guy was a sinner or this would not have happened to him. Or perhaps this was a punishment, okay, for his parents' sin. And so they thought that that was the case. And so in seeing this man, they thought, hmm, let's ask Jesus what is going on here. So this is verse 2 of John chapter 9. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, so tell us, who was it? Who sinned? (laughs) Was it this man (laughs) or his parents that he was born blind, right? Interesting, intriguing question. And this is how Jesus responded to this question. Verse 3, guys, ladies, let me tell you, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Are you saying that they're not sinners? They are sinners. All have sinned and fallen what? Short of God's perfection, his glory. So he was saying, hey, listen, this Specific disability is not correlated and connection to, connected to a specific sin. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Okay. Now there's a ton going on in this response and I'm going to highlight two things. The first is this. Specific sins in the past don't always correlate with specific sufferings in the present. Did you catch that? Okay. Often we think about, well, we think of this karma mentality, right? Right? Oh, I did this, so therefore this is going to happen to me. Okay. Now, sometimes that's true, right? 
If you, for instance, are lying to your spouse, your spouse will not trust you, right? Cause and effect. That is sometimes the case. But it's not always the case, okay? We cannot specifically, well, this happened because I sinned. Maybe not, right? Do you know that we live in a fallen world? Do you know that, right? Things are not as they were designed to be. It is under a curse. And because there is a curse, things don't function well. If you're driving to church and you get a flat tire, right, it's not because you kicked the cat, which the cat probably deserved, by the way. (laughs) Joking, I love cats and cat people. The Lord is working through my heart, right? But it doesn't always connect. Your tire could have, um, you know, went flat because you ran over glass, right? Right? And so it's interesting to note that Jesus reframes the question. This is the second thing. Often we ask the wrong question when it comes to pain and suffering. We ask why versus asking what for. Now listen. We spend so much time, energy, and effort looking for the cause of pain and suffering versus asking for the purpose of the pain and suffering. We want to focus on the cause, and God wants us to focus on purpose. Do you understand that, right? We're always looking for, well, I'm suffering because so-and-so and such-and-such, and you may be, right? And some people are born with disabilities that had nothing to do with their spirituality, okay? What is God doing? What is he saying? Why is this happening? So instead of looking towards causes, Jesus reframes it and says, don't look at and investigate and be all about the cause, but look at the purpose and what is happening here. And this instance, he said, well, this took place so that God's glory may be seen. Well, we say, well, Yeah, that totally makes sense because the dude was blind, Jesus showed up, now he sees. And we can say amen to that, and we should say amen to that. But what about the people who are blind and continue to be blind and then they die? What about the people who are in a wheelchair and continue to be in a wheelchair and then they die? What about those folks? How can God be glorified? (laughs) You laughing at me, you laughing at me. (laughs) I know you, I know you. (laughs) Lenny can be asking God, why is this happening, right? I know better. He knows better. I know Lenny. I know Kathy. I know Mario. I know. God, what are you doing? God, can you glorify yourself in this? And God does, and He has, and He will continue to do that. So in your pain and suffering, and you all have pain, right? You all suffer, right, in one way. People die. Things hurt, right? People don't treat you right sometimes. Instead of bemoaning your circumstances... Christ helps us to see and ask the question, God, what are you doing through this? What is the purpose for this? God, help me to see how this can bring you glory. Do you understand that? Right? So often we ask the wrong questions. We fixate on the pain versus seeing the purpose. This is thinking Christian. And it's hard to think this way, but Jesus continues to reframe our pain and suffering, and we do indeed have it. Do you remember in Scripture that talks about this over and over again? Here's a couple of references for us to consider. This one is Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For Paul was talking to us, encouraging us this way. So he says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, okay, 
present tense, not saying that all suffering will be taken away because it is not here and now, but it will be someday, believe me. He says that I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you understand that? I can't wait for the day in which these two guys are standing tall, towering over me, and you know the joy that they're going to have will be far greater than joy I have being in this body, right? And they'll look down on me. <laughs> Boy, they're tall, right? The glory in eternity far outweighs any sufferings we experience temporarily. Even if it is for a lifetime, it's only a lifetime. Yo, right? Eternity is so much longer. Christ points us to the purpose of God's glory in the here and now and also what is yet to come. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, For our light and momentary troubles, do they always feel light when we are under the weight of suffering? The answer is no. They're crushing they're debilitating. They are pressure-inducing, and they are heavy. God helps us and sends us the Spirit and empowers us and enlightens us and has others help us with this and also says, listen, understand that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us what? An eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If you think the suffering is heavy, uh, you better hold on because you will not be able to bear under the weight of the glory. Right? So what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is what? Temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. God has a plan through pain and suffering, right? And in this, he saw this man. It wasn't because there was any sin specific for this specific problem. But in it, God was going to work his glory. So please be asking God, what is your glory in this difficulty. If you do that, your orientation would change, your heart will change, there will be light that shines into the circumstance, and you will see God's glory. Ask Him to show you it. Fix your eyes not on the cause of suffering or the suffering itself, but on the purpose and reward of our troubles. And we could say, Amen. Right? So Jesus reframes this for this man, right? reframes it for his disciples. He said, mm, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to talk to this man, we're going to connect with this man, and by the way, this has happened so that there will be eternal glory. And the next thing that Jesus says about himself as we read this passage, John chapter 9, verse 5, that Jesus is the light of of the world, right? Now, if you remember, and if you've been with us for a while, you recognize that he already said this. And if you go even to the beginning of the Gospel of John, it talks about he being the light. And this theme of light and life runs through the Gospel of John like a thread in a garment. It is there everywhere. And so Jesus, stepping up, saying that he is the light, was not just the life giver and the recreator as he demonstrates physically, but primarily the one that gives life and light to everything eternally. And so in this guy who was blinded and could not see, he proclaimed that he's the light and he showed it physically, but it was way beyond the physical sight that he was looking for. It was sight of the heart. Now, there's a lot of people, and most people in our planet, their eyes work just fine. 
They say they have physical sight, and you'll see as we read, okay, as we heard about, that there's Pharisees who think that they knew the truth, they knew who Jesus was, and they were diametrically, diametrically opposed to Christ and resisted him, and they were blind as bats spiritually. I wonder, how do you see today? How do you see Christ today? Do you see him as the Son of God? Do you see him as your Savior? Do you see him as the Lord? Do you see him as the authoritative teacher? Do you see him as the sovereign one? Do you see him as the Lord of all creation? How do you see him? We'll see him again as the great shepherd. We'll see him again as the true vine. We'll see him again as the high priest. How do you see? Because he is the light of the world, not a light of the world, right? The only light that brings life to all things, and by the light of Jesus, we can see everything else clearly. But without him, we are blind. We are lost. We stumble around in the darkness, banging into things, hurting ourselves, not knowing the way. He says, come to me, right? Focus on me because I will give you life and I will be your light and I will guide you through life and give you eternal life. This statement of Jesus is significant I am the light of the world, and next to him there are no others. And so he said this in this context. And so next we see him then healing this man. So again, this is the next thing we see. Jesus is the healer. And it's interesting how this happened in this circumstance. This is John 9, 6 and 7. So after saying these things to his disciples, to those hearing, to this blind man, he spit on the ground. Now, Jesus didn't need to do that, right? We see him healing other ways, right? Spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva. (laughs) Know what Jesus was doing right here? Irritating the spiritual Authorities, right? Intentionally, right? He healed on the Sabbath, right? He could have healed this guy any other day, right? He's like, mm, we're going to wait for the Sabbath and make sure some of those guys are around here, right? Because they believe, the spiritual leaders, that on the Sabbath you were to do zero work, Right? And they got it um, so specific that they said you can only take a certain amount of steps. And if you took one more, it would be work. Right? And the, one of the things you couldn't do was knead bread or make mud. Because God forbid that if you did that, you're a sinner. Right? By the way, Jesus said the, <laughs> the Sabbath was made for man, not man. For the Sabbath, he said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Right? And so Jesus, intentionally, instead of like, hey, you're healed, <laughs> he said, hmm, who's looking around here? Oh, okay. Right? Roll, roll, roll your mud. <laughs> Gently down the stream. <gasps> what are they doing? Right? Took the mud. Put it on his eyes. I said, all right, go wash. Take off, go out of here, go away. And he did this because he wanted to slip away because he had a bigger plan, okay? Saw this with the guy at the pool of Shalom, right? Go over there, go away for a little bit. I'm going to slip away, right? Y'all see this? <laughs> so the man, okay? And this, there's another whole line. You look at how this man came from not knowing Jesus to worshiping Jesus. And there's all of that. He was pulling him along, right? He said, hey, go, go, go wash in the pool of Shalom. Right? And this man 
went, right? And he washed. And he came home seeing, right? Now, could you imagine what it was like for that guy, right? Could you imagine that? Never seeing anything in his entire life. Always had to be um, led around. Always had to be careful where he was going. He, someone told him and put this mud in his eyes and told him to go. So he went. And then he went down into the water. And then he could come up seeing. Could you imagine that baptism, right? <sighs> right. Obedience to the one's whose word changes everything. So Jesus is the healer. And sometimes Jesus uses regular means, right? Our bodies heal themselves. You can say amen, right? If your body didn't heal yourself, we'd all be a mess at around six years old, right? We'd all be done, right? That's God's intention. God created things on this planet that helps us us and heals us and we can say amen to that and sometimes God does it supernaturally and sometimes God heals us in eternity but in the end everyone's going to be healed right it's not about intent it's about timing and so Jesus then the healer healed this man and healed a man who had been born blind. This is a big deal. This is another sign of his divinity that he indeed was the son of God. Because only God can heal those born blind. According to Isaiah and other places in Scripture where it prophesies when the Messiah comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. And he meant way more than physical healing, even though physical healing was included. We have to recognize Jesus as the healer, recognize his purpose, recognize that he is going to bring glory to himself regardless if you're healed immediately, if you're healed through time, or you're healed at the very end. Trust him. Right? And don't let anyone ever tell you that if you're not healed, you lack faith. That ticks me off. Garbage theology. You should not pay attention to anyone who proclaims that to you. Jesus' purpose comes through healing or lack of healing. My grace is sufficient for you. I know you don't want to heal to hear that, right? When I'm throwing up, I want Jesus to come and say, stop throwing up. I'll be, yes. But if I continue to throw up, God, help me to glorify you in this If I'm sitting in a hospital and I've been there, God, will you use this for your glory? That is thinking now like a Christian, right? Jesus is the ultimate healer. Now, also in this passage, we see this about Christ, skipping down to verse 31. They have that conversation about this man and his purposes and going to his parents. And we see this conversation with the Pharisees. And they're like, well, who is this guy? And they were scared, like, man, you're going to throw us out of the the synagogue. And he says, hey, 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 I don't know who he is, but I'll tell you what happened. I was blind, but now I see you, right? And he talks about these conversations. And then in this conversation, verse 31, this is what this now seeing man said about Christ. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Jesus is the one the Father hears. Now the debate was that those religious leaders are saying, this man is a sinner, right? He did this on the Sabbath, proves he's a sinner, he's not from God, he's doing this because he's demonically empowered, he's demon-possessed, he's a blasphemer, and we should kill him, right? This is what those opposing Christ were thinking. This man was saying, yo, hold up a second, right? 
I know I was blind. I know I can see. This was a miracle bona fide, and he could not do this if God, his Father, did not hear him. If he was not righteous, if he was not doing God's will, this would not have happened. So hold the phone, Pharisees. This man hears, the Father hears from this man. He's not only righteous in who he is, never sinning, but he does the things that are right and godly and good. The will of his Father, which he claimed time and time and time and time again. He is indeed the one whom the Father hears. He is the one who is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And this man stood on this testimony in fear of being rejected by the religious community saying I'm following Jesus regardless of what you do or say about me he says well surely he is a prophet and I'm sure those religious leaders were seething at this point right they got mad at him it's like who do you think you are you're going to tell us you untrained, blind, beggar, good-for-nothing, side-of-the-road person. Full of pride, arrogance. Thought they knew who this was. They kicked him out. Now, that could have been the end of the story. right? The dude got sight. It's a good day for him. right? Got kicked out of the Jewish community and the synagogue, but hey, he can see. That was not the end of the story, and the point wasn't that he could see. The point was that he would believe. Next point, Jesus is the one to be believed. Now we're understanding why this was included in this gospel. Let's check it out, John 9, 35. Now, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, intentional, on purpose. He stepped away, let things unfold, and then he comes in at the right time, just as he will in your story as well. He heard that they had been throwing him out, and when they found him, he said, How's it going, brother? Do you like seeing? (laughs) He He didn't say that. That wasn't the point. He said, Hey, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, this title, Son of Man, was impregnated in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 7, there is this image of the Messiah. And the name of this person, what was called him, was the Son of Man. That's why Jesus used it in code time and time and time again for those who understood. He says, hey, do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe in the Son of man, verse 36, the man replies, well, who is he, sir? He never saw his face. He says, tell me, tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen In fact, he's the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, King, I believe. Now, what did he believe? He believed more than this was a healer or someone who initiates, someone who had authority. He believed that this was the Son of Man the Messiah, the Lord. The point is not that Jesus is an authoritative or moral teacher. Is he indeed, but so much more. The point isn't that he's the great and gentle healer. He is, but so much more. He is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He is the Lord of all lords. Do you trust your life to him? Lord, 
The one that I submit myself to. The one that I put myself under. The one that I crowned as king of my life. The one that I endeavored to serve. I believed. Do you believe in Christ that way? Not just things about him, but believing in him. In him. This is the point of this passage. And check out what he connects to this. This man said, Lord, I believe, and did what? Worshipped him. Jesus is the one to be worshipped. Believed in, absolutely. Honored, yes. And then worshipped. Now this is significant all throughout the Old Testament. All throughout the New Testament. If someone worshipped something or someone other than God, they either got in serious trouble, right? Or in the case of Paul or even angelic messengers, when people would want to worship them, they say, don't, don't, don't worship me. Worship God. And when this man came and believed in Jesus as Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him, Jesus didn't say, yeah, don't do that. He received the worship. The fact that Jesus did not say, mm, don't do that, right? It's another point that points to that he is indeed God. The point of healing, the point of teaching, the point of initiation is belief connected to worship of Christ. What we do here in our, in our singing is not just try to warm the crowd up for the message, right? It matters, right? The angels sing holy, holy, holy. We sing to one another as we focus our hearts and our minds and our mouths and our bodies on the one who is worthy of honor and praise and indeed is God and worthy of our worship. Jesus is God and you are not, right? The end result of the Bible and of the Gospels is belief expressed in worship, expressed in love of God and love of your neighbor, right? Even if they smell, don't like you, and have cats, you have to love them. <laughs> Why do I keep talking about cats? <laughs> Hear me. <laughs> the ultimate expression of Christianity is not that you know facts about Christ, it's that you love Christ. Honor Him. Live in Him. Trust yourself to Him. Follow Him as your Lord. Jesus is the one to be worshipped. And at the very end of this story, it's so interesting, it comes full circle, right? Starts with blindness, and it also then ends with blindness. And the worst blindness is not the physical blindness because it's temporary. The worst blindness is spiritual blindness because it's eternal. Right? So what if someone sees or is healed but fails to believe and they still end up with a Christless eternity. The point is spiritual sight. That we can perceive who this is, the light of the world. And so these people who thought they knew all the answers, and there's plenty of people in the world who think they know all the answers. There's plenty of people in the church who think they know all the answers. 
Don't allow your heart to be blind to the true focus of the universe, which is Christ. Right? You are not the center of the universe. Well, I know that, but you don't always act like it. You think everything revolves around you, and it keeps running around, and you keep tripping up. Life isn't about you, it's about Christ. If you get that right, you'll get everything else right. right? Starts there. Right? Jesus said, and we're going to end this, and we're going to go into baptism, <laughs> for judgment I've come in this world, right? For judgment, when you meet. I thought you came to save. Yes, he came to save. But in order to save, those who are not believing in him are therefore judged. It's like a physician who has to amputate somebody's arm, right? He's not there to amputate the arm. He's there to save the life. In order to save the life, the, amp, the arm that's infected has to be amputated. His point is to save, and in so doing, there has to be judgment. Why did he come into the world? So the blind will see, and those who see will become blind, or think they see. <laughs> Some of the Pharisees were like, are you talking about us? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a second, he's talking about us. <laughs> he said, yeah. <laughs> if you were blind, you'd not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see... Your guilt remains. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound who saved a wretch like me. Jesus the Christ, and we'll continue to see him as we read chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, as we read this, fall in love with Him. Tell people, if you know Him, your testimony. Follow Him. 